Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Tester Donnelly from Texas, United States. Dr. Donnelly is a complex and minimally invasive spine surgeon practicing in his hometown of Dallas, Texas. He's a native Texan. He attended medical school at the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center and graduated top of his class with a distinction in research. He then completed his orthopedic surgery training at the University of Miami and the Jackson Memorial Hospital. He continued his minimally invasive spine surgery training at the Rothman Institute at Philadelphia. Early in his career, Dr. Donnelly placed an emphasis on medical research and his contribution of more than 70 peer-reviewed publications and a dozen book chapters has allowed him to be invited to many speaking engagements across the United States to present his findings. He's active on social media, especially Instagram, not as a marketing platform for patients, but as a way to connect with other healthcare providers. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Chester Donnelly from Texas, United States. Over to you, Chester. Thank you very much. And I know that as we were saying before, it's really is a great privilege to be sitting on this side of the camera. I've been following you and your education for many years when I was in my training. So to kind of be here with all the other people that have been um, sharing on the various YouTube videos and platforms you have, um, very humbling, very cool to be on this side. It is a privilege today to join the ranks of your prior guest lectures and talk to you a little bit about sciatic pain. So what I'm going to do today is go over the what I'm calling the 2020 update of the surgical and non-surgical management of sciatica. Uh, this really is aimed for people of all places in the healthcare profession, medical students, residents, nurses, PAs, even radiology techs, to kind of go over both the diagnosis, the medical management, as well as um, what we can do surgically and non-surgically to really treat this condition. The key goals will be to differentiate axial back pain from severe nerve root compression, to identify which physical exams are indicative of nerve compression, to identify which non-operative resources have peer review support, and to recognize the patient benefits of minimally invasive lumbar surgery, both in the immediate term and the long-term future. So what is sciatica? You know, it's important that you know sciatica is a pain symptom. It's not an actual diagnosis. There are three main medical diagnoses that cause the sciatic pain. One is a disc herniation. This is the cushioning between the vertebral bodies of the spine when they herniate out and push on a nerve root. The other is on the back part of the spine, spinal stenosis. This is when you have degenerative changes, almost like callus formation on your hands. Well, it's this additional callus formation that I like to say is then pushing on the nerve roots as well as the spinal sac causing compression. And the other is a medical term called spondylolisthesis. And that's just a fancy word for a slip disc when one vertebral body, either through trauma, but most likely through just chronic degeneration, is unstable, moves forward on the other vertebral body, and causes a narrowing both in the canal as well as the foramen and nerve roots that exit. These symptoms, you know, it's not always weakness that you see. Most of the time, about 60 to 70% of the time, according to the sources that I cited below, these patients present with numbness, burning, tingling in the leg or the foot. About 35% of patients present with a shooting buttock pain and pain running down the leg. Weakness of the leg or the foot is also seen frequently, and this is commonly seen as a pain that increases with coughing, sneezing, anything that increases the abdominal pressure. We like to joke that not all patients read the textbook when they're developing, but one way that, for the most part, patients present is if it's an issue at the L2 nerve root. While this could be a weakness with hip flexion, the iliopsoas, and the pain in this area is usually in the groin area. Um, one thing that definitely needs to be ruled out is hip pain. So on all my AP views of the lumbar spine, I definitely make sure to include the hip to make sure there's no hip pathology or dual pathology presenting. L3 nerve roots present um, also in the medial aspect of the thigh, L4. It's more of the quadricep muscle. This is sometimes when you see ankle flexion, the tibia muscle. L5 is when it's kind of radiating from the back of the leg, running down over the anterior part of the, sorry, back of the thigh, anterior part of the leg, kind of going into the toes. And S1, this is kind of a classic one that's seen. This is where it starts in the buttock area, runs down the posterior thigh, kind of wraps around and gets to the outside or the lateral toes in the foot. An interesting study. I bring up this is from one of our top journals, the Spine Journal, 2017. So they had one patient who had a pathology that was known. It was a 63-year-old male who had right L5 radicular symptoms. 
and they had him go to 10 different MRI centers, and then they reviewed these MRI reports. So, interestingly, what they found was this patient with 10 different reports had a wide variation of findings. They compared these findings with the findings of two spine-trained MRI uh, or spine radiologists, and they kind of determined how many errors could occur. The things they looked for was vertebral alignment, disc bulge, central stenosis, nerve root involvement. What they found is that there's 49 different um, findings and none one finding was reported in all 10 of these reports. Interestingly, they found that there was only one that had um, one finding was in 9 of 10 reports and this is anterior spondylolisthesis, so the slipping on the L5 S1. So pretty big finding, but it wasn't even found in all the reports. There's poor overall agreement in these 10 reports. Only 20% reported a disc herniation at all five levels. One reviewer reported no disc herniations. The study um, also showed there's an average miss rate for herniations, almost at 50%. There's variations in nerve root compressions due to disc herniations. And 20% of the cases, this was reported at L2, L3, and 40% L3, L4, and 30% at L4, L5. So when you compare the expert read with the of the radiology centers, um, you really find there's underreporting of the patient's actual four instances of nerve root involvement, which really occurred at 72% rate. Looking at the graph below, it shows that for both disc herniation and nerve root involvement, the false negative rate, so the miss rate, was 50% for disc herniation, 72% for nerve root. So kind of just giving emphasis that we really need to clinically look at it ourselves. A uh, specific example they pulled up was L2, L3. The expert radiologist reported this as severe central stenosis, which is when you have more than two-thirds of the canal compressed. This finding was not even reported in 40% of these MRI centers. Uh, it was reported as just moderate stenosis in 50%, and only one agreed with them, saying that this was severe. So, in conclusion, there's an average of 12.5 interpretive radiology uh, center errors. These were across the 10 different um, MRI reports that were collected. While radiology report is a key tool and should not be um, dismissed, it just needs to be correlated with the history and physical exam. And remember, we're not treating the report, we're treating the patient, and over treatments as well as delayed treatments could come if we're only looking at the report. So moving on, this is a great article that came from 2014 and also one of our top journals, the Spine Journal, and it gave recommendations to various guidelines to kind of provide some clarity. One of the important ones that I get asked about a lot is the role of EMG. Should we use EMGs? Pretty much what they found is that EMGs and nerve conduction studies really just help tell the provider there's muscle weakness due to nerve irritation, but it does not necessarily pinpoint which nerve is being impacted. You, don't, you do not need to routinely order an EMG or nerve conduction study if the clinical exam correlates with MRI. Specifically, one study that was discussed here from 2013 looked at 108 patients that had either L4, L5, or S1 pain over a two-year period. They got an uh, MRI for these that confirmed there was a disc herniation, and then an EMG. What they found is that the EMG was abnormal in only 42% of these MRI-conferred disc herniations. So while the EMG is helpful, really it should just be a tool for differential diagnosis when you have something else going on, like a peripheral concern. Uh, another important study that was reviewed in the um, larger the spine study was this 2016 study from Clinical Orthopedic Surgery Journal. And what they found is the effectiveness of oral corticosteroids in managing disradicular pain. So they had 40 patients who had back pain. They had oral, corticost oral corticosteroids or the control drugs, which are pregabalin, and they wanted to see if there was improvements in pain at two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. What they found is that the steroid group had better improvement in radiating pain at all time intervals. They are less disabled and greater physical health scores. They did not find there was any difference in satisfaction after taking one medicine versus the other. But interestingly, their improvement was there. So they're still unhappy, but their pain is improved. So the conclusion was oral corticosteroids for the treatment of lumbar radiating pain is more effective than gabapentin and pre -gabalin. And this is pretty much thought today. We usually do prescribe a short course of oral steroid dose pack to help these patients. Um, this is a really great article, 2018, from the European Spine Journal. And what they found is uh, additional guidelines. So some of the other guidelines, they said, so should a patient with recent onset of back pain be advised to stay active or should they rest? After reviewing multiple studies, they came out with their formal guidelines that the patient should stay active and that staying active outweighs the very minimal risk of um, 
being active. They also sought to understand if individualized patient education would be helpful for patients. What they found reviewing studies listed below that an individualized pain education does not really help with pain relief, but it does help the patient with fear. So it should only be specifically offered in patients who are anxious or overly worried about their low back pain to help with fear avoidance or passive behavior. These guidelines went on to then look at spanu spinal manual therapy, which we know in the States as chiropractic therapy. Interestingly, based on the studies cited below, they found there was a small statistically significant effect in favor of manual therapy, chiropractic therapy, on the short term and pain intensity. There was no difference between those who had it or didn't on their activity improvements, but for pain intensity, this did help. Another thing I looked at is should patients with recent onset low back pain be offered supervised physical therapy in addition to their usual care. Um, this includes back specific strengthening, stretching, and motor control exercises, and they overall did agree that physical therapy does help these patients. Interestingly, they cited a study that they found to be high grade of evidence from 2011 that looked at inversion therapy in patients with a single level disc herniation. What they found is that in patients that use these inversion tables, surgery could be avoided in almost, in this small study of course, could be avoided in almost 76% in those that had the inversion, whereas um, it was overted in only two patients in the control group who didn't have the inversion table. So again, while that was a tiny study they're citing, there is a potential that these inversion tables probably don't hurt the patient and could in a way help. Just another non-operative thing we can use. This also looked at um, comparing a randomized control trial of the McKinsey method versus motor control exercises. So this is a great study of 70 people and they are randomized into either group. What they found comparing these two different physical therapy modalities is there is no difference in the strength or muscle thickness of the uh, core muscles of the body, transverse abdominals, intern and external obliques. But what they did find is there's global improvement favoring the McKinsey method compared to the motor control exercise methods. Um, a great paper from 2017 that has also been cited a lot. Uh, sorry, this one 2018, but it won the award in 2017 for outstanding paper looked at a minimum of five-year follow-up in patients who had an epidural steroid injection to see how they're doing now. So the conclusion for this was patients with radicular leg pain greater than four for six months, and they had an MRI to confirm there was a single disc herniation, and then they called these patients at five-year interval to see how they're doing. What they found is, first of all, only 50% of the patients responded, so decent follow-up, but not great. Uh, there could be uh, a bias just based on the follow-up rate, but those that did answer they found that almost 77% had a history of recurrent pain after their initial epidural steroid injection. Of those they contacted, 23% were still in pain, 7% were taking opioids, 23% had a subsequent injection, and 50% of these patients that are initially treated with an injection eventually had surgery. So what did this tell us? Despite a high success rate at six months, the majority of patients still experience recurrence of symptoms during the five years. Fortunately, few of them were currently painful, only a quarter of them, and a small minority required an additional injection. So injections are a great way to effectively treat short-term uh, pain to a way to avoid surgery, but long-term recurrent rates as well as surgery are high regardless of what's done. So just reviewing our two pathologies we talked about earlier, spinal stenosis, so the posterior elements of the spine compressing uh, both the roots and the sac, as well as spondylolisthesis, instability in the spine. One of the highlighted key papers in spine surgery of the last decade is the SPORT study. This stands for Spine Patient Outcome Research Trial. And there's three branches. They looked at disc herniations, central stenosis, as well as spondylolisthesis. What they found is they were able to do this over 13 centers and have a wide variety of patients. They looked at six-week outcomes, three-month outcomes, six-month, and then one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year outcomes. This is a $15 million grant by the NIH and really provided us some great information. So how did they do this? First, they had one group that was randomized, essentially telling the patients that this is the study, flipping a coin, and this is where 300 patients went. The other were maybe telling the patients this, but they decided they didn't want to either flip the coin and they picked their own path. So that was another 300. Now in any study, there's always some crossover. Maybe the patient flips the coin for surgery and then they end up not getting the surgery or the patient says they want surgery and then they end up not getting surgery, or they say they don't want surgery, and then they end up getting surgery anyway. So looking at the crossover of this, 
um, there's some pretty interesting things that we can look at. And those who chose surgery, 97% got it. And those who initially chose non-operative care, 33% of those eventually got the surgery. Looking at the rates when you start combining the groups who just had surgery or just didn't have surgery is where we start getting some of the advanced data. So there's early advantages that were noted at two years as well as all the months prior that surgical treatment was better and was well maintained at four years and those that did have surgery if you had spinal stenosis or spondylolisthesis. At both two years as well as four years, those who had surgery had improvement in back and leg symptoms. They had better overall satisfaction with current symptoms and they had improved self-rated progress. Those that had surgery versus didn't have surgery. Looking at all three of our sports study publications, we came up with some really great data in these 600 patients. Surgical recurrence rates for any of these conditions was about 14% at four years. Specifically, if you had a disc herniation that was treated surgically, your recurrence rate was 8% at two years and about 10% at four years. Infection rates in all these groups was just around 3%. The dural tear rate in these 600 patients, or I guess it would be the 300 that um, had the surgery, was about 10%, and there is no increased rate of adverse outcomes in those that had a tear. No patients were paralyzed as a result from surgery, and nerve root injury was extremely rare. If you look at the different groups, those that had surgery for disc herniation, which is almost 800, had only one instance of nerve root injury. Those that had surgery for spondy, which is about 400, had just one, and those who had stenosis and have surgery, there were no instances of a nerve injury. The presence of a pre-op neurologic deficit did not affect the overall result, either surgical or non-surgical care. So again, this is just great information from Dr. Hillebrand to help counsel our patients. So now there is an update. It's 2018, what can we look at now? We now have eight year follow-up from this group. What we can find is that at eight years also, those that had surgery compared to non-operative treatment are still doing better. They have improvement in pain and function compared to the non-operative treatment. An interesting thing that this study looked at was the fusion technique, looking at a 360 versus all posterior fusion, um, as well as uninstrumented, which is not common at all anymore. Uh, they looked at those three types and there was no difference in their outcomes based on the surgery technique. So then finally, how do you treat this? You can either do this by the open surgery, which is the more traditional way and certain pathologies demand an open approach, or the newer technologies and newer training and subspecialization. You can do this through a tubular decompression where there's main goal is pretty much less muscle and tissue devascularization. There's multiple studies that could argue either way, but the overall consensus with the tubular decompressions is that there's improved postoperative immobilization by the patient, getting up, moving around. There's accelerated discharge times with the patients that get it done tubular, and there's a lower infection rate as well as medical complication rates. Some of the key, very recent papers that look at this from very impactful journals this is a 2019 publication from the Global Spine Journal. They compared uh, T-lift procedures, which is going through the back and putting in a cage all posteriorly. They looked at 63 patients that had this done MIS versus 109 done open. What they found in this 2019 publication is interestingly, those with prior opioid use undergoing an open T-lift procedure were unfortunately more likely to remain on opioids compared to the MIS approach. At six weeks, this was 87% versus 65, three months, 63 versus 31, and at six months, 50% of the open versus only 21% of the MIS. So that's a really important thing to look at, especially in this era of narcotic abuse and us trying to fight that. We also report that the MIS T-list had a significantly less total inpatient opioid as well as Oxycontin use. And they also reported that in the MIS group compared to the open group, there were shorter length of stays favoring the MIS group compared to the open group. Another study from 2018 in spine similarly looked at these two groups for a TLIF. Um, the total cases was 227, 111 of these were MIS, 116 were open. Again, this is another study that showed there's a statistically significant difference in the length of stay favoring the less invasive approach, 2.7 versus 3.6. These authors also found that the minimally invasive group had lower complication rates, both in minor complications, all complications, as well as 90-day readmissions. So we went over some very key papers from only high-rated journals. The things I wanted to highlight today was that sciatic pain is really from a compression of a nerve root, usually at 5.1 um, in the adult degenerative population. Earlier treatment is key, but studies show that it's not detrimental. We can try to ride this out with both physical therapy, injections, 
oral steroids, non-operative care should definitely be the first line indication. Staying active is helpful. We want patients to be getting out there, be working, be trying to fight through the pain and work through it. And surgical options have a great track record. There's many great MIS as well as open approaches that we can do. And uh, spine community is going to keep pushing these forward. And so with that, I'll take additional questions. And I really appreciate the time and opportunity to be able to come speak today.